quite old. The World War II guys are into their 90s. Uh, by the time you graduate high school, there'll be no more World War II veterans left. The Korean War veterans are in their uh, late 80s. The Vietnam veterans are in their 70s. And then we have uh, our younger generation of veterans. This morning with us is Matt Printer, uh, very unique to the school because he's a former graduate of cl uh, class of 2004. Uh, graduate played football for us, uh, and then upon graduation, I, I believe it was a month, Matt, uh, right after you graduated, right after you graduated, was uh, sent to the United States Marine Corps down at Camp Lejeune, and then deployed to, I always thought it was Afghanistan, but I, I always announce it wrong, but today I'll announce it correctly, he was deployed to Iraq, and had a lot of combat experience as a, uh, a young soldier. Uh, he talks about his tradition from, uh, his transition from being in high school one month and in the desert in combat in the next one. So uh, this is a high school match, so don't be, uh, you don't have to sugarcoat. Match presented in the middle school uh, several times, and that's a little different age bracket, but uh, several of Matt's comrades were killed in action, and he will, uh, he will give us the details of that story. So Matt, uh, welcome to Ponagansett. Glad to have you. Matt's a fireman, worked all night, uh, and now he's uh, we're drinking coffee. He's here first thing this morning. So uh, the other classes were able to look at Matt's uh, foot locker, some of his gear, some of his football, some of his Ponagansett stuff, some Iraqi money, uh, and, and a lot of photographs, which will, Matt's willing enough to let them stay here, uh, but we have the flag on display, so. Mac, good morning, and, and welcome to the high school. Sweet. What time? Come we have uh, we have a good hour. All right. So, uh, what's up, everybody? How you doing? <laughs> All right. So, like Mr. Kalinda said, I'm Matt Printer. I graduated from Pontiac in 2004. Um, joined the Marine Corps. Spent some time in the Marine Corps. Uh, I was in 0311, which is uh, your basic rifleman, your infantryman. Um, deployed to Iraq, and then was on a thing called uh, Expeditionary Unit, which is a, uh, for lack of a better term, it's a strike group put on Navy ships. And we do some, we do some other stuff uh, around the world as a part of the, uh, a big strike group. And that took me to a bunch of different places. Um, a, lot of, a lot of that deployment was training for, uh, training foreign militaries, um, Jordanians, uh, we stopped in Africa and went to Dubai, some other different places. Different things. Um, I got out, had a break in service, and then um, got bored. Needed some more adrenaline, some more purpose, so recently re-enlisted, and now I'm with uh, an Army Airborne Infantry Unit, jumping out of planes, having a blast. Did a bunch of stuff already, so a good time. So. Over the course of the next hour, you guys got questions, feel free to shoot them out. Anything that pops into your heads about, about anything that you feel, all right? I know it's a little bit early for you guys. Everybody's starting to wake up, but I'm an open book. So like uh, Mr. Kalenda was saying, I think it was roughly from the time I graduated high school to uh, almost, almost to the day, a year later, I was in Iraq. And at that time, that was 2005, so Iraq was, the major invasion, the push was kind of, was over, but one thing that the, the leadership decided, the overall leadership of the United States decided was to disband the Iraqi military and try to control uh, the entire country, just ourselves, and that created a lot of problems and a lot of fractures within the country as far as, uh, how everything from basic civil services like water and food distribution is concerned to uh, policing uh, that country. So there was that created a vacuum for um, an insurgency to start forming. By the time we got there, it was pretty much the Wild West. The no rule school was permanently out. We used to set up in schools um, because they had a like a five foot high wall around them. It was a high point usually. Villages, um, 
hardly any Iraqi police around at the time, but we did work with them. And it was, like I said, just a big document for insurgents to come in and try to rule that local populace and have them sway towards the side of, of whatever local insurgency um, that was there. So one thing, like our, our mission set was, it's called security and stability operations. So basically it's what it sounds like it is. You're, you're moving into your area of operations and you're uh, providing security so that way the local people can do whatever the local people do. And you're trying to hopefully build civil, some sort of civil services, whether it's uh, reestablished schools, um, maybe there's civilian projects going on that you're trying to support. What had happened was is that didn't happen at all. What had happened was is that, that the insurgency was so bad uh, that we just went into a different, um, our whole mission set went from trying to do that to just create, find intel on insurgents and find them, find the bad guys and go take care of them type of thing. That was kind of what it was. Um, and because of that, a lot of seven guys out of my company were killed, including my lieutenant Nelson. So that's a brief overview of that deployment. And then my second deployment was, like I said, being on that strike group. And at the time it wasn't uh, like you're trapped on a ship for a long time and it kind of sucks. You can't really go anywhere or do anything. And that's kind of boring. And getting off the ship is, is a nice thing, even if it's in the middle of Kuwait and there's nothing around you. But um, in retrospect, it was a good opportunity because you get to see a lot of different places and meet a lot of different people. That was good. Um, so yeah, so going back to going back to the Iraq thing, who who's got some questions about that? Because I don't even think you guys are anybody born in two thousand five. A couple, okay. So shoot shoot some questions. Let's make this interactive. You, like you, talk you, you mentioned insurgents. Explain to them insurgents. They're the bad guys. Yeah, does everybody not know what I mean when I say that? Like what your insurgency is? So there's that power, there's no more standing form of government within that country. Or, it's, or the government is very fragile. It doesn't have, um, it's not controlling that country in the way that you think a government should control that country. So for lack of a better term, you have you have gangs or factions of different insurgencies that are around, all vying for power. Different, um, different tribal feuds, there's a lot of tribes in Iraq, there's, they're split down secular lines between um, the Sunnis and the Shia Muslims. Um, there's a lot of blood history that goes on between uh, those two, uh, those two ethnic uh, subsets of that country. When you have the Kurds to the north, it's a, Iraq's a effing mess of just tons of blood history and mismanagement and a bunch of other stuff. And we just kind of jump right in the middle of that. And it's like trying to control a bunch of unruly kids that their parents never spanked and just they're running around and they're just kind of, it was just, it was a mess. It was a, it was a very uh, tough job for uh, being a conventional military force. And conventional means, um, like in a conventional war, there's there's a bunker and there's a machine gun in the bunker and you have tactics to go uh, execute and destroy that bunker so that way more people can come in and you take more ground. That's your conventional, that's your conventional fight. That wasn't, the majority of the stuff that happened in Iraq was not that way. It was all very unconventional stuff. It was, we don't know who the enemy is because the enemy's not wearing your traditional uniforms. That, that military was disbanded. So now we're fighting an unconventional war with conventional forces. So that means that, and they were smart about it, just like in Vietnam with the Viet Cong and the North, North Vietnamese uh, fighters. They had to be smart about it because now you have a small group of uh, fighters fighting a more technologically advanced, larger military force. And how do you do that? Well, you pick your battles as far as they're concerned. 
they're only going to do things that ensure that they're going to have the upper hand at all times. So that means a lot of, everybody knows what IEDs are. Anybody not know what an IED is? If you know, it's all right. So, thanks. So an IED is an improvised explosive device. It could be a, it's a, it's a bomb. Trap. Yeah, it's a bomb. And it could be anything used uh, for destroying vehicles with personnel in them, or as the case of my lieutenant, it was a booby trap artillery round, so a big artillery round that was set to go off when the door was open. <clears throat> so that was one of the ways that ensured that, that they could inflict casualties by minimizing their own uh, casualties themselves. So their gunfights, like actual shooting engagements, that would happen either because of that the, the insurgents were untrained and didn't really know what they were doing, and they were just like, yeah, we're just gonna go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Americans, and that didn't work out well for them. Or they had matched so many people that they, <coughs> that they stood a better chance of gaining the upper hand in an engagement. Um, so anything that gave them, we call it in the military, we call it standoff distance, which is you're utilizing some sort of weapon to allow yourself to not be uh, not be close into your to your engagement to your threat. So in other words, it's like your rockets. Like shooting a rocket gives you standoff distance because you can be pretty far away and shoot a rocket. And by the time the rocket hits and people figure out what's going on, you're already gone. So rockets, mortars, it's a bomb drop down the tube and it shoots up and comes down. That's standoff distance. IEDs. We had a big sniper threat. We had one guy get killed by a sniper. Tons of Iraqi army guys get killed by the same sniper. So all these all these different ways the insurgency was really smart, utilizing the standoff distance to kind of wage their own war against this bigger, stronger um, military. So a lot of these insurgents weren't. Uh, you have. You have like your diehards, and you can Wikipedia this afterwards, I might get this wrong, but I'm pretty sure you have, like your diehard terrorists are gonna be called like your, uh, they color code them, so like it's, that their color is black. Like they're, they believe in the ideology, they believe in their, in their mission, and when they're gonna stop at nothing to do that. And then at the very bottom of that, you have like your white level, uh, insurgents and terrorists, and they're just terrorists of opportunity. They're, they might be a farmer, and someone comes along and says, hey, if I'm gonna give you two, if I give you two of these rocket propelled grenades, and you shoot them at the next convoy that passes, we'll give you $500. Sound good? And they're like, yeah, all right, yep, because that's more than they make in you know, a couple of years of work. So, you're doing all, the there's, there's that situation and scenario, and there's a situation and scenario of, you have 18 year olds like myself who came from Pontiganza, who are all full of testosterone and rock music and playing Call of Duty, that go over there and they just want to get it on and kick doors down and chuck hand grenades and blow stuff up. And that's not the majority of the fight that we're fighting. So what happens is, is the, that 18 year old doesn't know how to interact with that uneducated 30 year old farmer and there's tension that lands are building between there and depending on how how we acted in certain circumstances and not having enough cultural training as to what their what their culture is like and the big do's and don'ts of it you can land up pissing a lot of people off and depending on how severely you piss them off that could push them towards joining the insurgency as well. And, and of course, another big thing is accidentally killing the wrong people. That's your quickest way to put people against you. So you're getting attacked from a building, you decide to call in an airstrike. Either you call in on the wrong building or that bomb goes short and lands up killing a bunch of civilians. You know, if you put yourself in their shoes, how would you feel if that was your sister or your brother? Now you talked about you yourself being 18 or 19 in Iraq. You have an average age of the guys in your unit? Where you, you yeah, probably, I, I would say it's probably about 20 is probably the average age. So you would sweat, like I turned, 
I turned 19 when I was in Iraq. And I think one of, like, one of my friends who was one of the oldest guys was like 24. And I was like, holy shit, he's 24, he's so old. Um, and I think our, our, our lieutenant was 24. Actually, yeah. Yeah, so he was, he was young too. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of, that was, that, was a, that was a kind of a crazy time. And you, and you see it now, if anybody follows that, what had happened um, during that time and then transitioning out of Iraq and we left and it was kind of good for a little while and then we left and there was, there was this, again, now there's a security vacuum because we pull out. And then in recent history, what had happened, to anybody know what had happened to Iraq like in recent history? Who came in and started just demolishing the country once again? They had black flags. Anybody want to shout it out? Anybody know? No? ISIS. Oh, yeah. There you go, ISIS. Yeah, ISIS comes in. They cross from the Syrian border. They come back into Iraq because they want to expand their, their caliphate or their, their holy ground that they have. And the, it was Iraq was very weak, and they could not protect their own their own country. But so we have military there now. Yeah. Not not the numbers that we have, right? We have still a, a presence. Yeah. And uh, and it's going to be an on you know fortunately unfortunately I don't know what you want to call it. It's going to be an ongoing thing. The Middle East is is uh, it's a big source of contention. Big, for a lot of different, we can sit here for a long time and I can spot off a bunch of stuff and I'm just gonna get like glazed eyes and because it's, it's a big, uh, once you start going in the weeds about why we're there, reasons why we're there, and, and it's just, it, it starts getting mind boggling. One thing I will say, <clears throat> as it relates to generationally and whatnot, is that one of the big, everybody knows what happened in Syria, overall big civil war, really, really bad, horrible stuff, right? Syria just kind of fell apart. One of the biggest reasons why that happened was because they experienced the, the most severe drought they've ever had. And that drove a bunch of those, uh, a bunch of the farmers and farmlands on that Fertile Crescent to start pushing into the cities to start already really straining an already strained government system until it finally broke. So, as far as that's concerned, that drought is directly related to climate change. So, not to segue into something else or go off too far into a tangent, but some of the conflicts, more and more as the years go on, are gonna be over resources such as that in different ways that we might not have realized before, versus like a conflict such as like World War II or World War I being over uh, different things, or even Vietnam being over the spread of communism. Right now, you're going to see conflicts being over resources, and that could be already strained countries with a very um, with a very fragile economy and a very fragile governmental system. And now you add in some sort of natural catastrophe to it, and that could be the catalyst for you know bigger problems. And unfortunately, groups like uh, like extremism, like violent Muslim extremism, or whatever other terrorist organizations that have uh, some sort of purpose or agenda are gonna land up filling that void that those governments can't fill for their own, for their own purposes under the guise of, hey, we're gonna help the, you know, the local populace. So that's gonna be your next. Uh, who is the, the tell them this, uh, I look at your boots every time they come out of the foot locker. Mm -hmm. Tell them what it was like weather-wise. Yeah, it's hot, super hot. It was kind of, it was, it was really weird because it was, we, so we got there in July. Um, and so we first landed in Kuwait. And when you're landing, you go from, like my whole life I spent, I grew up in Foster. Who's from Foster? Yeah, Foster. All right, so <laughs> grew up in Foster, surrounded by trees, always out in the woods. And then I went to uh, Paris Island for boot camp. Still trees, I thought the trees were melting because it was so hot in North Carolina and uh, or South Carolina. The, uh, they have Spanish, everybody knows what Spanish moss is? It's like, 
shit that drips down, it's like moss that comes down from the trees. And I did not know what that was. And I was like, what is all over these trees? But still trees. And then I trained in North Carolina. And then finally, we do our play to plan work up. We're going on first stage is landing in, in Kuwait. And as the plane's landing, the cabin is, is getting warm. Like the windows are hot to touch. And it just looks like a, an enormous uh, beach. Anybody Star Wars fans? No one wants to admit this. I know, you one. All right, so it's like Luke Skywalker's home there, like Tatooine, just completely desert. There's nothing around. And I'm like, I didn't know that there were places on this earth that looked like this. And then we land, and it's like probably around 125, 130 degrees, just there, baking in the sun. And then you go to, and then we took a short flight to uh, where we were at, at, I think it's called Takara. We call it T2. It's like this little airport. So we flew there, and Iraq was, at that time, in the heat of summer, it was probably around, like I said, 125 to 135 degrees. So hot that, like, if, you're, if it's not a dirt road, if it's an actual asphalt road, and you're walking down that road, the soles of your boots are going to start melting onto the asphalt. And as you're walking, they kind of, like, stick to the ground. Leaving, you're leaving footprints on the ground because your soles are melting. So we would cook ramen noodles. Ramen noodles are like a big thing. I still have like this weird relationship with ramen noodles. But uh, we had these big <laughs> bottles of water that would come from Saudi Arabia, these big boxes. Then we would lop the top off, pour half the water out, shove your noodles in there, and then just <coughs> keep it in the sun. And your noodles would cook in the sun just because it's so hot. Fast forward to Around, around Christmas time, around December, and it snowed. So, I could rent out a tent if you want to find. So, snow, actual like, a couple inches, woke up one morning, super cold, and I'm like, this place, this is a cozy place. <laughs> so, yeah. Tell the, the first time, I believe you were deployed, you were not married, but the second time. <clears throat> no, I got married. You got married? Yep, got married right before, um, right before I left. Well, the first time you didn't have children, and the second time. Right. Yeah, I made it. I'm, so I have two kids. They're both in the military. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I was married prior to leaving, and then wife is pregnant. Came home two weeks prior to Brady being born. And then my second deployment, um, the wife is pregnant again, and then uh, Brennan was born a month, a month early. So I missed his birth. I had to call him. I had to call home at, like, 2 in the morning on top of the flight deck of the ship, like hiding between helicopters, asking about like some what's, the, what's the time difference? Is it, is it a half a day difference? Is some maybe. Uh, it's a while. So yeah, so that's, uh, so there's that. So based off of what I said, who's got, who has some questions? Who want to toss out? Randomly. Go ahead, buddy. Does that burn them or that's a good that's that's good. You're, you're covered in uniform so like parts of your skin that are exposed would they get dry? Yeah, I to be honest with you, I cannot remember ever putting on sunscreen. But we had some gingers. Who's who's got red hair? Yeah, the dude, oh man. One of my best friends would call him Big Red. And he would shave because all the if you're a new guy and it's your first appointment, you get your head shaved. And so his hair is like growing out and he looked like a uh, one of the cheesy puffs for a while. <laughs> Poor kid, man. He just did not do well. He, he, would, he would fry, his skin would burn, and he would just have the damnedest time walking around in that heat. So, yeah, you got sunburn, but it's like, you're not like, you're getting shot at, yeah. and you have a sunburn. Like, you kind of don't, like, that <coughs> just kind of goes away. Like, whatever, whatever about that. So, that's a good question, though. What else? Yep, go what ahead. about heat stroke? Yeah, same dude. My buddy, same ginger man. Yep. And, uh, got, uh, right before he deployed, he ended up getting heat stroke bad. And uh, I want to say his core temperature, because we were training in the Mojave Desert. And his core temperature, I think, was around 105. And they had to ice bath him and fly him out on a helicopter. And ever since then, because that's one thing, like you get heat stroke that severe, one time you're going to be more susceptible to that as time goes on. Um, so after the Iraq deployment, he couldn't um, he couldn't operate as a infantryman anymore. He had to transition into another job for the rest of his contract. So 
who else? It's a good question. And what about the equipment that the United States, so were you guys adequately equipped? So <clears throat> that's a good question. So the Marine Corps has always prided itself on getting Army <coughs> hand-me-down stuff. We have it's the smallest budget out of the DOD, Department of Defense. You know, we do more with less. And the Marine Corps thing is like, what we lack for in equipment, we make for in training. It's a very, um, we always equate it to like the Spartans and the 300s and Leonidas. And, you know, it's all, Marine Corps is big on warrior ethos and, and what your mind can achieve and overcome in any given circumstance. It doesn't matter, like, I don't have a rifle, I'll use a rock. I'll use a, I'll sharpen a stick and I'll still, you want me to take the machine gun nest with a stick? Well, screw it, we'll do it, let's do it, send it. So, our, our gear was not, our gear wasn't the best. Compared, comparatively to the Army, we were right, like, our home piece was that this was a big thing. Um, I probably have pictures of them. The majority of the Army units that were there had, uh, had not, not too used, well, borderline brand new Humvees with nice, like, polarized uh, glass, blast, uh, blast resistant doors and all this other stuff. They were, they were, we call them hardbacks. So when you look at a Humvee, the back swoops down. They have nice gun turrets with, with armor around the gun turrets. And then you look at the Marine Corps, and it's like legit a bunch of the motor transport Marines, the guys who fix vehicles, like went to the part of the base where all the Humvees got blown up during the invasion and kind of went, mm, all right, let's get a bunch of these vehicles, cannibalize them. So we had like these blown up vehicles that had green hoods and, and tan side plates, and they just looked like bags of ass all over the place. And they had, and they were, we called them bucket trucks. So they were basically, you had where the driver and the, and we call it the A driver, sit in the front. And then the bucket was a square, uh, square box of armor with seats that face each other. You can just ride around in that thing all day. And we lo it looked like a band of gypsies because our gear was hanging off the side. And the armor and the, the trucks were, weren't made to carry that armor. So the wheels, instead of the wheels being like this, they were like bowed outward. So the wheels would wear, it was a mess. And you couldn't go over like, <coughs> Humvees don't drive very fast anyway. I think you can get them up to like 55 miles an hour. I think we maxed out at like 35. So, yeah, it was pretty, pretty ridiculous. But the Marine Corps also prides itself on like ripping the army off whenever we can. So we would try to steal shit from them whenever we could. But as far as gear goes, like our weapons, um, that was, that I think we were, we were kind of right around what the army had at the time. M16. Yeah. So we had. Now they're old. Now that I'm back in and I see like what we're what we're using now, like the, the stuff that I originally used was like the brand new stuff of these, like what's called an M1684, which is, it's the full version of the M16 with rail systems on the side of it, and that's the majority of what we used. And then it was all iron sights, there was no optics on the tops of the guns until we got over there. So like the army would deploy, the army would train with optics here in the States and all this other stuff, and then the Marine Corps would train with you know, iron sights, which whatever, it's, it is what it is. But then the Marine Corps would get overseas and that unit that you're replacing would like take their optic off their gun and hand it to you. And then you'd put that optic on your gun. So it was, a, it was like a weird, if you look back on some of the stuff, you kind of chuckle at it. But, uh, but yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of different developments. Like our, like even our uniforms, like that, you know, the, the um, desert camouflage uniform that's over there. That's, there was no winter uniform or summer uniform, it was one uniform with buttons and that's, that's what we wore. And a couple years later they developed um, these, uh, almost like an Under Armour combat shirt type thing. The military, as far as like technological advances go, hey, they're pretty good at it when it comes to certain stuff, but like it took them like forever to, to figure out that, hey, maybe we should have like a lightweight shirt that guy should wear. One of the things that blows my mind, so everybody knows what an MRE is, but who doesn't know what an MRE is? It's your ration, all right, cool. So it's your ration, it comes in like a, like a hard plastic bag, right? And it's got like a, uh, a flameless um, heater in it, so you can heat up your, whatever your ration meal is without having a flame 
And at nighttime, flames expose yourself to the enemy, so you don't want that. So they would give you all sorts of, they call them beverage-based powders. So it's like Kool-Aid, <laughs> cocoa, and all this other stuff. You don't have, there's no, there's no device that you carry on your body to put beverage-based powder in. So half the time you just pour it in your mouth and swish it around with some water. And that's what you do. There's, not, there's nothing, you don't carry canteen cups anymore. You don't, there's none of this stuff. And it took them like 25 years to put a little plastic bag in the MRE thing so that you could put your powder in the water and shake it up and drink it. So that's kind of, it, that shows you kind of like the military is all over the place as far as how it brings stuff up to speed. So. Tell them that, what drew you to the military? I know you were in the Young Marines when you were here. Yeah, I know. Well, what, what was the, the deciding fact? Was it 9-11? No, it wasn't 9-11. So the, I, I don't know what it was. Um, my grandfather had served, so my father's father served in the Navy. He was on a, 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 a bigger armed transport ship that transported Marines as they did their island hopping campaigns during uh, in the Pacific. Um, my mother's father was, uh, he was either a cook or a mechanic for a bomb group station in England during World War II. I had like another uncle in Vietnam. Um, I don't know, I think a lot of it was, my father was a firefighter and he would always have, we were always watching the History Channel or prior to that it was just Channel 2, PBS and like whatever Ken Burns was putting out at the time. But the, it was always floating around, he was always reading books, it was always, it was always part of my, in my brain and I was a typical like young dude who would go out in the woods and play army with his friends. And it just, I think something just kind of hit with me different. I think part of it was seeing my father's dedication to service as a firefighter and visiting him at the firehouse and seeing how he interacted with, with those guys in the firehouse. I think the biggest thing that drew me to the military was the brotherhood. Like I wanted to experience that. Um, I wanted to know what that was like because that's, that's almost transcendent. Like you can have you can have tight, close-knit friends, um, but then you're gonna transcend that friendship to a higher level once you start doing really hard stuff. And then the next level up from that is doing really hard stuff where you're gonna get killed doing it. So that creates a different sort of bond between people. And, and that was what really drew, drew me to that. And the Marine Corps thing, I saw a Top Gun Back when I was like a little kid, some of you guys might not even know what Top Gun is. It's an awesome movie. But it's all about uh, naval air combat. So dudes taking off from carriers and shooting planes. That's what I want to do. I wear glasses, I have contacts in me now. And I remember the, the optometrist, I'm like six years old, and I asked him if I could be a fighter pilot. He's like, no. So I was like, all right, well, I guess it's the Marines it is from like that early age. So I had every intention of of staying in the Marine Corps. That's probably why I did not take, well, no, it is one of the biggest reasons why I didn't take school um, very seriously. So during my time at Pontiac, I was, I was an okay student. <coughs> like, I think, who's got Mr. McCurdy, anybody? <coughs> All right, so one way I passed Mr. McCurdy's class for chemistry <coughs> because I wasn't doing well, because I'm not doing well, so Mr. McCurdy, I got I gotta pass the class, man. Like, what can I do? And at that time, it was, um, what the hell did I do? I did do some, like, some makeup work, and then I cleaned one of his fridges up. And that's, I gave me that date. So, different times. And, and I just didn't take it seriously. I'm like, I'm joining the Marine Corps. I don't need any of this stuff, whatever, math. I'm just doing my thing, and I'm gonna spend 20 years in the Marines. And then I got in. I was having a good time, I had a family, and then I realized that being, a, like I wanted to be a father, uh, and I wanted to be home for my kids, more than I wanted to move around and have this off tempo feeling so high, so I made the decision to get out. And that transition was, was difficult, it was pretty hard. Um, but then I found my way, and then now my boys are older now, and then I got, I got bored and needed some more purpose, and wanted to get back in the game, so that's it. Now, can you walk them through the school? You know, there, there was there was Iraqi 
people that loved the Americans, there was Iraqi people that did not like the Americans. <coughs> Walk them through when you were going to the school and you, and you had to, you were gonna set up at the school. And were you a radio, I, I thought you were a radio man. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me talk about that. Right, all right, so. <laughs> also to tell us that the radio man, just like in Vietnam, he's got a target on his back. And you, you can explain to him, you know, so what Mr. Glenn is talking about is the, the, so yeah, so within that within that platoon, like my job, not only being a rifleman, was I carried the radio equipment for the platoon. And you have, um, and, and usually, we call them big man packs, so you, you have all different types of radios that do different types of things. And at that time, we were still using these big green, they weren't Vietnam era, but they looked like it. They were probably like early 80s versions of that radio, but they were big box man packs and you just stick it in a backpack and it had a big antenna that sticks out of it. And like anywhere else, that's that's a target because usually your radio is gonna be around your leadership. So that lieutenant's gonna wanna have communication <coughs> with uh, all the other higher ups in the area. He's gonna be coordinating airstrikes. So you you do have more than more than other people, you do have a target on your back because you have these big antenna that flying around half the time. Um, we try to mitigate that and not put that up and kind of fold it and, and leave it down. And if you didn't get good radio reception, then you pop it up. But my, my role when we got to Iraq was to, um, to create effective communication between our platoon, the adjacent platoons operating the area of operations, Talking to air assets, talking to any other any other assets we had in the area, relaying that communication to the lieutenant. So, because of that, my job dictated me to be around the lieutenant for the majority of the time. When the lieutenant was killed, uh, we had pulled up to, a, like I said, school was not in session. School was out, so we pull up to schools because of the way those schools were built. It was almost like a compound. So we're in this one, this one shady village. Usually when you roll up into a village, people are still out doing their normal day-to-day -day thing. And uh, you kind of get a vibe. You, you, you kind of go around, you, you do security patrols. You just you pick a route on a, on a map. Uh, you let your higher-ups know what your route is. You go on your patrol, and your whole responsibility is just getting the lay of the land. You're gonna stop, you're gonna talk to different uh, villagers or, or people in the city, kind of get an essay on uh, what has, has, has the insurgents, if there are insurgents around, which faction are they from, where are they moving, have you had any interaction with them, and then what do you need as far as you know, food, water, whatever, how can we help them type thing. So we were doing that, we set up in the school, but this one village, like no one came out. It was like a ghost town, but everybody was locked down the doors. So we went and did some other operations. A couple days later, we went back to the same village. And now there's black spray paint on the side of that, that wall that goes around. So we're snapping pictures of the black spray paint. That's how we can generate intel, figure out what it is, figure out what terrorist organization is working out of there. And I'm in the back of this, this bigger truck, and the explosion goes off. And uh, so I'm like, all right, well, now we're taking contact. Time to find the lieutenant and figure out what we need to do. So I'm going around asking for where the lieutenant is. And uh, I'm, I'm not getting, no one really knows what's going on. People are pulling security. Um, people are returning fire. So we land up, uh, <coughs> someone says, hey, the lieutenant, and then my former squad leader at the time, they're like, hey, Lieutenant Ski went into the school. So me and two other guys enter the school clear up to the third floor, and as a, and if you picture a square, right, like a chunky square, and then cut the center of it out, so the center's a courtyard, so all your classrooms are on the, are on the outside. So to get to each, when you, when you go to different, like if you walk out in the hallway, it's just a, it's just a balcony walkway as you walk around. So it's all open, except for the classrooms. So we went up to the, the third floor, Fared all the way up to the third floor, start making our way down the hallway, and the end of the well, the end of that walkway is just covered in dust. And as we got closer and closer, there's this huge, uh, like four by four, gaping hole in the in the roof with like rebar coming out. And I was 
super confused because I thought a rocket had hit the side of the building. And then uh, there's a body laying at the bottom of the stairs, which was, I, I didn't know who it was, but at the time it was my buddy Ski. And then one of the other guys um, went up around me to clear the stairwell to get up to the roof, and that's where they found Lieutenant Kathy's body. And she was killed at 17. Uh, Ski landed up living, but he lost his arm and his leg. Because as they got when they when they went when they entered the school and the whole reasoning for entering the school was to get up on top of the high location and kind of get a lay of the land from an elevated position. So when they went up and Ski grabs the there's like a door a door to get to the top of the, the roof line. So the lieutenant standing like this facing facing the door, Ski's in front of him and Ski grabs the doorknob like this. And as he pulls the door open, it triggers the explosion, and he loses his uh, right arm and left leg. It's not explosion. Uh, yeah, and the time was killed, and it was just this really. Uh, anybody see uh, Saving Private Ryan? All right, so a couple people. So there's that famous scene with Tom Hanks in the beginning of Invasion of Normandy, where he's got he's sensory overload. It's just too much. He's on the beach. He's behind one of the one of the obstacles, and he can't. There's all this stuff happening around him, and it just everything goes dim, and he can't. He can't hear. He's just kind of in a daze, taking it all in, and someone's shouting at him, like, "Hey, what are we doing? What are we gonna do?" So that's what I call like my Tom Hanks moment, uh, or my Saving Private Ryan moment. Was that as soon as we got up to that level, like like. I didn't. I couldn't hear anything. My uh, platoon sergeant's talking to me, telling me because I'm the radio guy. So now I get a call on the medevac, and I'm just not hearing him. And that took. That was probably a couple seconds. But finally, he put his hand on my shoulder. He's like, "Matt, hey, you better call this in." Um, and then it was just a race to get. We knew. We knew the LT was killed. So I got to get his body out. Um, we knew Ski was in rough shape. So we got to medevac him. So how are we gonna do that? We don't have any stretchers. The Marine Corps doesn't have to carry stretchers around at the time. So I'm running back downstairs, ripping, uh, ripping bench sheets out of the back of the truck I was in to try to make some sort of hasty stretcher to get bodies out. And as I'm going back up, they had already taken both the guys down, but there's just there's just chunks of of human flesh like all the way up the stairs. And that was the first ski land of living. He's doing really, really well. He's actually uh, the vice president for Homes for Troops. So he lives in Maryland, but he flies up here to, uh, outside of Mass, because the Patriots are, they have a big, uh, I think they're maybe the big sponsor for, or Rob Clark Craft is the big sponsor for Homes for Troops. So he's always had the meetings up there, so I've seen him periodically, but he's doing awesome. Um, so yeah, so that was, that was my first, Oh my God, moment within combat. And then after that, we had six more, six more of those situations of varying degrees uh, within that six month deployment. A very famous photo that went viral. Uh, you can look it up. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, kind of yeah. And his wife looked yeah. up. Where, where was that, Matt? Was that here or was that there? No, that was, that was in Reno, Nevada. Nice. Uh, so the, around that time, Times Magazine had asked. Uh, there's, there's a group, every every branch of service has a group that goes out to make the notifications to families that their loved one's been killed. And previously that was like a closed, close to the media thing. And then Times Magazine <coughs> ended up asking Lieutenant Kathy's wife if they could uh, document <coughs> her pretty much and show the American people what this what this is like. Like what, like you, the, everybody's getting bombarded on the news about you know, there's a roadside bomb and three Marines were killed. And you know, day after day, there's just some shit and it just becomes this bottom ticker on the thing of, of it, it happens with such frequency that everybody in the country starts getting numb to it. So how do, we, how do we bring attention to the fact that, hey, there's dudes losing their lives? So Times Magazine asked uh, uh, Mrs. Kathy if they could take pictures and document it. And actually, that's like, now it's time, one of Time Magazine's 100 Greatest Photos. So there's a, there's a, a picture of it up here from our, our news clip that you can see. But uh, what was freaky was uh, 
he was killed August 21st, 2005. And then that December, life goes on. There's a mission, you gotta do the mission. So life goes on for us. And then in December, that Times Magazine article hit. And uh, I, was, I, was in, I was doing radio watch inside one of our combat outposts. So I'm sitting in front of a big radio van. And our platoon sergeant comes in with the Times Magazine and he just kind of tosses it down on the, on the table. And it's, it's the whole article of Lieutenant Kathy. So it was, it was, that was really, that was, that hit in a different way because we know the guy. We lived with him, we ate with him, we knew his family. And now Times Magazine's doing, a, doing an article about him. And we're seeing, we're seeing what happened after he got home. So yeah, it was pretty rough. But, uh, and, then, and then like I said, then six more guys after that. <coughs> It took us a while to get Matt to come to Lee's Cross County. Yeah. His father in law was there, so. Yep. And Matt, you wear a bracelet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so from time to time, you see guys have a black bracelet, or black's kind of my generational thing. Our veterans, Vietnam guys usually have silver bracelets. Um, originally, they were KIA and MIA bracelets, so killed in action or missing in action. Um, my generation. It's just, it's a way to remember your fallen brothers. I have a, I have a sleeve tattoo, and that's all, it's pretty much all dedicated to that service with the bracelet of seven initials on it uh, for the guys who were killed. So, and some of their families, you know, you end up coming back from that deployment, and the families are there, and you end up meeting those families. And it's still, that stuff, not in the frequency that it did happen, but we're still engaged in um, extended conflicts around the world. People are still getting killed in combat operations, so this is it's, it's still a thing. You know, it's going to be a thing for a while. All right, who's got? We got like 15 minutes here. Who's got more questions? Who's got more questions about the military in general? Because that's usually where we transition from from that stuff to uh, military. Anybody considering joining the military? A couple. What grade are you guys in? We have a mix. This could be anywhere from a freshman to a senior. Yeah. Any, any seniors that are thinking about joining the military? Just one? <laughs> All right, cool. Hey, um, usually sometimes I present with, some, with somebody else, and there's always, this is kind of where we split off, because a lot of the old time guys will be able to, they're, they grew up in a time where uh, service was one thing, and they don't recommend military service to anybody. And that's their, that's their opinion. And this, there's no right or wrong to it. My whole spiel is, like I tell my kids, I'm like, I don't have, I don't have enough money to send you guys to college now. So you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to do something. And within that realm, there's plenty of opportunities to do a bunch of different stuff. Um, so it's always something, uh, it's always something to consider if it, uh, if it works out. That one, uh, Mr. Clinton had this one story. <coughs> it wasn't the first year I did it. Probably a couple of years later, Lydia Cook. Yeah. And she's still, this girl, Lydia's been That's my sister. That's, my sister. She's that's she's your sister? Oh, yeah. well, there you go. So Lydia still hits me up, lets me know what she's doing. That's a, that's a perfect example of someone who's like, hey, you know, wanted to do the military thing for a while, and then she's, she's doing ROTC with the yeah. Citadel or something like that. So she's going to be a commissioned uh, officer. You know, pretty soon. So she's setting her, <laughs> she's setting her, her path up. It's just another, it's just another path. And and as for me, um, I think I realized that military has always been part of my life, always been something I've always wanted to do. So getting, like I said, I recently got back into that, and now within within a matter of months, like the the uh, 75th anniversary of Operation Market Garden, which was a big. Um, Allied failed parachute operation within World War II, centered around Holland. It was the 75th anniversary of that and the 75th anniversary of the uh, invasion of Normandy. So I got to go to Holland and jump in to Holland on the 75th on the same drop zone that the 82nd Airborne dropped into in World War II on the day 
in a bean field. I was eating green beans coming off the airfield. It was wild. It was awesome. It was a once in a lifetime thing. It was super cool. So there's a bunch of different experiences. Now, what's it like jumping out of a, a perfectly well worn airplane? That's intense, man. That's awesome. But it's, I always say, whenever I get asked that, yeah, there's a, you go to the school, you learn how to do it. And then when you're standing there and you're getting ready to do it, there's, you're going to, you don't want to be a bitch. You're going to do it anyway. That's what you're, that's what you're doing. But there's that little dude in the back of your voice that's like, go back to your head, that's like, what are you doing? What, what are you doing? Silly, silly man. And then, and then you do it, and it's awesome. So it's a good. Uh, Mr. Florian's son is uh, was on the, the Naval Academy jump team. Or yeah. Oh yeah. So. And and what's cool about that, and what's cool about anybody who jumps, it doesn't matter if you're a if you're a general and this is your 80th jump, or you're a private and this is your sixth jump. The same. You have the same thoughts and the same. As long as if it's <coughs> jump Hollywood style, that means you're not jumping combat equipment. You don't have the mission after the jump. You're just jumping to be proficient in jumping. When you jump and you land, inevitably, you're going to be bullshitting with the other guys you jump with. And it doesn't matter if it's the old fogey who's jumped for forever. You're going to have the same, there's that connection of like, oh, the winds were doing this. And that, I think that pilot was at the bar last night because we were going everywhere. I almost puked. I don't know, blah, blah, blah. It's the same. It's a great equalizer. It's kind of like the. It's kind of like water and swimming. Like if the, if the, the, the plane, the air, everything does not care who you are, your race or your creed. You're just jumping into the abyss and jumping at nighttime is pretty wild too. Yeah, it's a good time. Definitely, definitely something I need. Can you explain the markings on the flag? I, I, you, you marked it. What is your squad market? Yeah. No, I was just. That was after the fact. So while we were in Iraq, it was during the first uh, congressional elections. For, I think it was congressional elections for the country. And um, as like a PR propaganda thing, in addition to our security and stability operations, we had to hand out, we had to hand out flags as like a propaganda thing. And like, here's the flags, go vote. It was, it was some kooky stuff. From, we ended up taking, we ended up keeping a couple of flags, and the insurgents, the uh, different insurgent groups, did not like this at all. This kind of trying to instill national pride within the Iraqis. So we would, we would take, uh, we would take these flags and put them on poles and like strap them to the side of Humvees and just drive as fast as we could down different roads to try to have the insurgents shoot at them so that we could figure out where they were. But yeah, I took one of the flags, wrote some stuff on it, just where I was in the time that we were there. And there's some other, there's a bunch of different stuff up there. I always forget every year what's in the foot locker, but that's a big thing. Yeah, Matt, do you share these stories with your sons? With the yeah, idea? Yeah, I mean, uh, great, well, the last year that we did, uh, that we did it in the middle school, Brady and Brent came up. And, and there's, and sometimes there's questions that come up of, uh, <coughs> Like sometimes, like those kids will say, like, were you ever scared and stuff like that? And yeah, absolutely, one hundred percent. And you get to a point where you just gotta make your peace with what you're doing. And, um, it definitely does something to your psyche where you make your peace with your own mortality as as an 18, 19, 20 year old person. You know, you have you think about where you're at right now. Think about all the stuff that you think about day to day, and then. It's hard for you to fathom thinking about like, hey, there's a there's a hundred percent chance that I'm not going to be here tomorrow. So how does that affect you going forward throughout your life when you do that for you know multiple months on end? Where that's how you, that's how you live. You live hour to hour because you don't know what's going to happen. I know it's hard for you to really conceptualize. It would be hard for me sitting in your shoes, um, but it definitely changes your mentality. And one of the things that I guess my oldest grader picked up on the other day was I fully intended not to come back from Iraq when we deployed because we were, we heard about where we were going. Uh, the whole rumor mill starts and I end up being privy to some information prior to, prior to us leaving. And it was a, it was an increasingly very bad place. Karma, like Wikipedia karma, and you'll read all about that, but karma sits outside of Fallujah. And the difference between Karma and Fallujah is Fallujah is a walled, a big walled city. 
Karma is smaller, but there's no wall around it. So it was like a way station for insurgencies, for the transition of money, arms, uh, the sale of weapons and IED makers. And it was just a huge, uh, cess, dangerous cesspool of stuff. And we had snipers and IEDs and insurgency threats and combined attacks on the police station. And, and, uh, and, and just shady, shady, uh, you know, police leadership and a bunch of other crazy stuff. So I fully intended not to, not to make it back home, and I made my peace with that. Um, and then I did. And I was kind of oh shit, what do I do now? <laughs> so, um, yep. How long were you your deployments? So Marine Corps deployments are six months. Yeah. So versus the Army is, if you are, if, if you're a regular infantry in the Army, it's. If you're a ranger or your special special forces, it could be anywhere between three to six months. Is usually what we Same thing for any special operations. Is usually between three to six. How about communication to uh, to your family while you're in Iraq? Yeah, that's now. It's definitely this is the biggest thing that's changed. Yeah, so this is a big thing. So back in the day, the how to call home was you either there was either Maybe your command, your command being like your company commander, so the dude in charge of the 130 guys you're with. Maybe he had a satellite phone that she could call home as a hot ticket item. Or even better, you have like a, we had a couple of embedded uh, newspaper reporters with us, and we would ask to borrow their phone. Or the next option was um, we, we would do snap vehicle checkpoints. So we just, be walking on patrol and pull some cars over, and we uh, jack their Nokia cell phones, and we take their SIM cards, and then when we roll up like a potential bomb maker, we steal their cell phone uh, and put the SIM card in, and you can call home using that. That wasn't a good idea in retrospect. Um, and then, but the biggest way we did it was we would operate, we'd be on operations for a month, and then you'd have like 24 to 48 hours off of, of that month. So operate. 24 seven for a month, have two days off, and those two days off would be in like a rear area, and there'd be a phone center, so you'd have like a uh, AT&T card, and you scratch it, the back is like a scratch ticket, and you call home, and there's a time delay. Um, AOL, instant messenger was still a thing back in the day, so if you logged on, if you got 10 minutes every month, you got 10 minutes of time on a computer, so that was the other thing. Nowadays, um, just to give you what it is now, the, in uh, June of this year, this past June, with the unit that I'm in now, we did, we are um, the only parachute infantry battalion in the National Guard. So we fall under an active duty unit that's stationed overseas as the, um, as like the uh, NATO, Strike package for and it, you, it's a lot of flexing against Russia is what we do. So we our operation was to secure an airfield, an enemy airfield. So it was a former Soviet airfield. And Brady was like all about for whatever reason Soviet stuff and plays airsoft and has all this Soviet garb or whatever. So now dad's jumping in with five hundred paratroopers at night into uh, into an enemy held airfield in the middle of Romania and it used to be a former Soviet fighter base. That's cool. So after like we got done with that and had a downtime, I could FaceTime them from from the airfield. So I'm like, I had a, I had a minute, we weren't doing anything. So I FaceTime them after we got home from school and I'm in Romania. My face is covered with camouflage paint. There's I'm showing them uh, uh, Apache gunships flying around. I'm like that's pretty, so that shows you where like technology has come from, where that's like an instant, and it's a good and a bad thing too. So, because they had some problems the year prior with guys ripping out cell phones and taking videos of, of some things that got out that shouldn't have been videos. So, it is what it is. Matt, do you feel uh, as you don't have to answer this question if you don't, but do you feel your unit accomplished its mission? Mm. That's a good question. Um, I, I, 
guess I guess you'd have to look at um, total picture. Yeah, I guess you'd have to look at the at the total picture. And and for you guys, I mean, this is a, this is a big this is a big juicy flight conversation to have. Like, why did we go to Iraq in the first place? Like, what was that when 9/11 happened? You know, our fight was in Afghanistan and on the insurgency there. Why did we go? What was our major reason for going to Iraq? And, um, the more you start delving into that, the more you start realizing that. You know, some of the administration at the time's agenda was to create a foothold within the Middle East, and, that, and based on the history we had with Iraq, that foothold could be created there, and we could have bases. And the theory was to have bases just like we have in Germany and across the world, except we would have it in the heart of the of the lion's den, so to speak, uh, and we could uh, expand our influence from there. I don't think the people that made those decisions actually know. People that made those decisions didn't have a good grasp on how that culture is unlike any culture uh, worldwide. So um, as far as as far as far that's concerned, creating that foothold, I don't know, you tell me, watch the news, what do we do? Because as soon as we pulled out of Iraq 11 years ago, ISIS moved in, and the Iraqi army gave up. Uh, now we're back, we're back, and we had to retake the same places that we took in the initial invasion. It's a mess. So, did we make did we make anything better for those people? I think for a short amount of time, we did. Um, but unfortunately, I think that one of the biggest problems within that country was you had under the Saddam regime the level of uh, uneducated civilian populace was unbelievable. And and you guys and even me when I was a kid too, like. You know, there's there's students that struggle with learning, and but everybody, but at the end of the day, when you graduate, everybody's going to have a baseline of understanding. Everybody's going to know how to read, do basic math, understand how to talk, voice inflection, concepts, think for themselves type thing, right? The, and we have programs for that. Like over there, there's nothing. So when you talk about working with, you know, 20 to 45 year old people who have zero education. So now you're trying to talk to them about tactics and concepts and, and different ways of going about things through an interpreter who's educated. They're not even understanding some of the words, the sentence structures that you're using. So it creates a lot of, a lot of issues for everybody. That's what I was gonna ask was, how is the language barrier? Uh, yeah, I mean, like I, I went to uh, like a survival level Arabic course prior to leaving. So at one point in time I could I could converse in Arabic to a certain extent, um, but it's it's like different. It's a different dialect. So we're learning um, like a Saudi dialect based off the Quran, because everybody kind of everybody in the Arab world who speaks Arabic uh, knows how to the, the Quran's written in kind of a base language that everybody can understand. But then that goes back to the undereducated thing. These people don't know how to read. They don't know the base language. Then what you're saying, those words don't don't make sense. It's like me. Mm, uh, talking to a baby. Yeah, yeah, we're talking to a small child, having this conversation with a four-year-old. You know, it, it, the, you're saying the same words. They're gonna be. They're, they can pick up on some, maybe some things, but they're not picking up what you're putting down. So there's the, un, the, the <coughs> undereducated populace. Which left that whole country susceptible to that easy money, shoot a couple rockets at some coalition forces, and, and make money. Like they didn't have the foresight or that or that knowledge to look at the bigger picture and see how that's going to affect them long term. So. Uh, wrap, wrap things up with your 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 need to serve in, as far as. The older Vietnam veterans and the Korean War guys were, were proud to serve. They, they got drafted and served their country. But you guys enlisted. You joined. How proud are you of your service uh, after returning home? Um, yeah, I guess, I, I guess that's, I don't know. Um, we kind of look, I guess our generation, like I was in 10th grade in high school when 9-11 happened. 
I had known I already wanted to join the Marines for a long time. This just kind of put a different, um, it, was, it wasn't, we weren't in a state of war prior to, and now definitely we're gonna go to combat. So after the fact, yeah, you're, you're proud of what you do. I, I'm, I don't know, I'm not a big like, I guess I'm not a big bell ringer about any of the stuff I've done. I think I realize that I need that regiment and that structure and even recently, like me being dirty and out in the out in the field, like pumping 75 pounds of stuff with a machine gun and being completely caked in dirt, not showering for a week, where nothing else matters, no bills, no girlfriend problems, no whatever. I don't have to answer to anybody but my team, my squad, the fight that we're having at that moment. Like that's something I need in my life. And that's not the case with everybody else, but um, I'm proud of I'm proud of what. The human condition, and especially what the uh, American can do at such an early age, for time and time again. Same thing with the World War II vets. Anytime this nation's going to conflict, uh, you know, for better or for worse, the youth of America stood up and said, "Send me," and they were very young. And that's that's pretty incredible that that keeps perpetuating. So I don't know if I answered. Is there a chance, uh, a very good chance, you'll be deployed again? Um, the way the the way the mission set is for the unit that I'm in, that it's I'm still part of the bigger picture. A lot of the fights you're seeing now are on the unconventional side of the house. So a lot of your special forces, and your unconventional warfare stuff, um, <clears throat> because they're smaller, they're full, they're what's called force multipliers. They can go in work with that host nation, work with partner forces. We do. We can do the same thing, but it's on a bigger scale. We're meant to take over, my unit's meant to take over enemy airfields and drop behind enemy lines and create pandemonium on a big, for, against a big uh, conventional military. Not, um, not work solely in small groups one-on-one -on -one with different partner forces to take out small cells of insurgent factions. So a lot of the conflicts you're seeing now are the, on the unconventional side of the house. As far as like big conventional stuff goes, maybe, but it's not gonna be to the level of which was it before, unless unless something really big happens, so. Matt's, Matt's offered his emails, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. always uh, for, for questions about the military, uh, and I always uh, had the lines of communication open with Matt, so if you have a question or, or a comment, Matt, Matt gets back to me and gets back to you guys uh, as far as the military. Some of the things that Matt did, obviously, uh, there's security, and he couldn't tell us. Because I was on the ship, but couldn't tell us what the, the actual mission was. They were going out ready to, uh, to take off the bad guys. But that's, for anybody who's thinking about joining the military, and you have questions, like definitely, you know, some things you want to kind of look into. So you can make the best decision before you do the process. But, uh, but other than that, if you have any other questions, let me know. Open door. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you. Can they go up and look at the stuff up there?